Well, coming up on today's show, the Audi e-tron motors go into production. Three more Model 3 performance reviews come out online. And a luxury Chinese EV startup launches next month in LA. Well, good morning, good afternoon and good evening, wherever you are in the world. Hello and welcome to the Wednesday, the 25th of July edition of EV News Daily. It's Martin Lee here with the news you need to know about electric cars and the move towards sustainable transport. Well, a little look back and a little look forward. If we're looking back, then last Saturday was an interview on the podcast with a company here in the UK that do not only solar and storage but also some very uh, very clever grid software solutions in terms of when you charge your EV, how you charge it how it'll work with the grid and all those kind of things. The company is called Moixa and I sat down with the Chief Technology Officer and if you haven't downloaded last Saturday's podcast yet, well I can highly recommend it. It's a fascinating interview. Good to have somebody who's properly knowledgeable on this podcast for a change, not just just me and my opinions. And a little look forward as well. On tomorrow's show, I'll be saying a very big thank you uh, to the team from Battery On Board from Ontario, from Toronto, or Toronto, I guess they would say. I've received some post. Yes, old-fashioned post through the letterbox. I'll talk about that on tomorrow's show. Well, let's start with some news about the Audi e-tron crossover. It's getting closer to the official launch. The e-tron name has been used in the past on things like the A3 e-tron plug-in hybrid. It looks like e-tron's going to be their sub-brand name, if you like. A bit like EQ is Mercedes' sub-brand name. So, whereas we've been calling this car the Audi e-tron for a long time, looks like we're now calling it the Audi e-tron crossover, but I guess if there is an official name that we should be calling it, uh, we'll find out on August the 30th. Reuters reports that the launch will be in Brussels, have a range of about 240 miles on the car and they also say that the Audi CEO Rupert Stadler was talking about prices and I'll just jump in here and add that that would be before he was detained by the law in a rather unfortunate series of events Uh, however oh and a new Audi CEO appointed in the last 24 hours? 48 hours? I won't go into that on the podcast. It's kind of geeky, automotive, industry, newsy stuff, not really about EVs. Uh, He's come from BMW, uh, by the way. Uh, However, uh, before uh, he was, unfortunately, uh, detained, uh, Rupert Stadler was talking about the price in Germany as being €80,000. Now, if you do a rough conversion, that's US dollars but be careful with that. I always be careful with that, with taxes, with incentives. Those prices can wildly change. Well, the entry-level Jaguar I-Pace is €77,000. Entry level Model X for the Tesla, €92,000 to put that in perspective. Oh, by the way, not that we don't love reading mainstream media articles about different EVs, but why can none of them get the names of the cars right? Is it just me? Because I pace for instance, is capital I hyphen PACE, all in capitals. It's what Jaguar have called the car, not what the journalist feels like calling the car in that article. So in these ones, it's capital I and then PACE is capitalised. e-tron, by the way, also has capital E, capital T. e-tron, the way that Audi will have this on the back of their cars, is all lowercase. Maybe, am I being picky? Am I I being really super anal about this? I just think that's what the car companies are, that's the name of the car, Either respect that or kind of show yourself up as having a really superficial knowledge about the subject matter that you're writing about. I'll move on. Uh, Sometimes on here I get a bit of kickback as well for being more positive about those German legacy makers for what they've done with lying about diesel emissions and things like that. And I understand why I get those that kickback in the comment sections. I understand why they are hardly on everyone's Christmas card list. But I would just say those large legacy automakers are being forced into making great electric cars by the likes of Tesla. And we know they can operate at scale when they want to. Audi in Hungary is one example where 6,000 employees make about 9,000 engines a day. You don't have to rewind the podcast. I just said a day for 32 different production plants of the Volkswagen Group. That's 2 million combustion engines made in 2017 alone. If they turn their focus to EVs, if they can make EVs profitable with a good margin, if they can start to sell them in good numbers and they turn their attention to EVs, just think what they can do. Think how quickly the change can happen if those kind of production capacities get moved towards making motors. Well, I got some good news. The motors are starting to be made. I got a note from the VW press office yesterday. On Tuesday, the 24th of July, yesterday, series production of electric motors, they say, officially started in Hungary. The company has invested a double-digit million amount 
Okay, let me work that phrase out. A double digit, so more than 10 million then, uh, to set up, or less than 100, I guess, uh, to set up the motor production facility. Approximately 100 people to begin with are employed in the new area at present. For the production of electric motors, Audi Hungary installed the innovative production equipment and islands within a year, they say. The departments for the pre development of electric motors and for production planning cooperated closely with the prototype manufacturing and production technology centre there. Uh, to develop the required expertise within Audi. Now, the current production capacity is about 400 electric axle motors a day, and that can be gradually increased. At present, about 100 people doing that, which will be 130 by the end of the year. Uh, Production on a one-shift operation, and that's soon going to be tripled to three different shifts. Uh, So I'll just jump in there and say that if they're making 400 electric motors uh, for each axle, uh, the e-tron is a dual motor car, of course, all-wheel drive. So that's 200, potentially, 200 cars they are making a day which is not that's not a bad start kicking off with around one and a half thousand motors being made every single week for their very first it's how they're ramping up that, that's not, not a bad start you're not talking tesla figures but it's an okay start well the electric motor uh, from the factory offers numerous new features they say so i thought i'd have a little look into this it's kind of interesting uh, with the uh, the stator one of the core components of the motor the aim is to insert as much of the thin enameled copper wire as possible into the casing you see the tighter the winding the more efficient the power delivery a uh, new winding and inserting center at audi in hungary makes it possible to wind an optimal amount of enameled copper wire particularly compactly and then insert it into the casing the electric axle consists of other large components like the power electronics in there as well all located in their own housing the gearing the two flange shafts which then uh, transmit the power to either wheel uh, and the employees produce two of those uh, for each audi e-tron so front and rear axles of course audi being legendary known for the quattro tradition so uh, that's a bit geeky bit nerdy but i thought you and i would like to dive into just exactly how they're making efficiencies with those motors and increased production Uh, we'll keep an eye as we get closer towards the launch of the e-tron crossover well three more model three performance reviews have hit the internet looks like some of those big websites and outlets were all invited to drive on the west coast uh, now those cars are making their way into the service centers cnet will kick us off cnet's kyle hyatt I quote, the moment you mash the accelerator, a whole new sensation hits, and it's immediately apparent that what you're getting for the added price. Based on early impressions, the performance seems to be exactly what we all expected. Uh, An experience not dissimilar from the standard Model 3, just a heck of a lot quicker, end quote. Uh, I should say, I think the cars they're all driving, by the way, are the performance performance, if that makes any sense, with the Model 3. So you get the Model 3 performance, but you can add a $5,000 performance package so some people calling it the p plus i like that or the p3 plus or uh, or p3d plus <laughs> or the performance performance you choose right you pick your own one and we'll go with that well motor trend are the next one that we picked up on in the last day and they say this and i quote even with four aboard i think there is a couple of uh, photographers the driver and a, a tesla pr handler uh, even with four aboard the model three Uh, They call it the DMP, dual motor performance. I don't like DMP. That's too close to dump, and that's not a great word. (laughs) But anyway, it's at the Model 3 dump. Uh, Surged ahead so startlingly that it stopped conversation, except maybe for an uttered, oh my God. I braked pretty hard, says Motor Trend, and arched up the on-ramp towards the freeway. It was a flourish, more akin to swiping a navigation route on your phone than driving a car on the actual road in maybe 120 wheel revolutions. A high-performance hierarchy has been rattled. The European marks, uh, perennially atop the sport sedan podium, are about to have trapdoors release beneath them. Although nothing has fundamentally changed with the car's steering or suspension, uh, besides a one centimeter drop in ride height the dual motor and all-wheel drive uh, gives the compact tesla a tensed hair trigger potency for leaping ahead or around whatever's in the way they call it a pure jungle cat and i'll move on to the final uh, review uh, mark vaughan at the uh, auto week west coast editor 
for Auto Week says, and I quote, uh, controlling all that power on its way to the wheels is a new vehicle dynamic control system. Now, Tesla no longer uses Bosch VDC, but has made its own. And Tesla says it allows their own engineers to more precisely tune the distribution of torque front and rear and side to side. Acceleration is strong, says Mark. Thrilling. And it's unclear whether you have to do that chemically ridiculous 30 minute preconditioning drill to get 0 to 60 in 3.5 seconds. Uh, whatever figure I was experiencing was impressing the heck out of me, he says. End quote. Uh, no, Mark, you don't have to go through a 30 minute drill to get that 0 to 60 time. Uh, you are referring there to uh, ludicrous mode, aren't you, my friend? In the uh, in the Model S, and it's an often um, an oft criticised feature. Uh, we'll call that. Uh, I'll put links to all three of those reviews if you want to read them in the show notes. Well, the long anticipated Hyundai Kona EV with its big old battery, 64 kilowatt hours, is now starting to arrive in the hands of customers and testers, and it appears to be everything that EV fans have been hoping for and more. If you want one, get your order in, says Max Holland for Clean Technica. Hyundai is only planning for 30,000 units a year in the near term. Most of the exports are currently going to Europe and won't be arriving here in the US till later in 2018, maybe 2019 as well. Pricing for the long run range 64 kilowatt hour version which by the way is the only version that will be sold in the usa it starts from around 34,000 euros that's 40,000 us equivalent be careful with those conversions though um 39,000 euros in germany 36,000 uh, pounds here in the uk and of course we have an incentive scheme as well a uh, us pricing will emerge towards the end of the year incentives in some markets effectively reduce those prices quite a long way he says in norway at that price the 64 kilowatt hour code is similar in cost to the Bolt and the Ampera E. Well, Clean Technica say the charge speed is an, an impressive 80 kilowatts. I always thought with the Kona and those LG Chem liquid cooled battery packs, it was 100 kilowatts. So I've checked out the official Hyundai website and it says this, and I'll just read you this uh, from the website Charge Time Quick Charge DC connected to a 100 kilowatt DC fast charger. 54 minutes to 80% state of charge. So they don't say the maximum charge rate of the car. They say the quick charge time when connected to a 100 kilowatt DC fast charger. Now, I think the implied message there is it charges at 100 kilowatts or, you know, plus minus, maybe it's 95, maybe it's 105. But I think the implied message there is 100 or maybe that's just what I've always read in the past and it's just stuck in the old noggin up there. And maybe the charge speed is what Kling Technica say, 80 kilowatts. Uh, charge speeds. You know what? I'll pop a little email to the Hyundai press office in Europe and see if they can get back to me and we'll clarify that. Well, another new Chinese electric car brand is on the way. You know, there's almost 500 Chinese EV makers at the moment. It's an insane number, isn't it? Uh, the new one's called Gion, G-Y-O-N, bankrolled by Cytec, itself an electric car brand under the pioneering Chinese car manufacturer FAW. Gion will launch during the summer next month in LA. We're keen to see what kind of luxury they have and good luck to any EV startup. Well, according to TeamBHP.com, images of the new Kia KX3 have surfaced online. The Kia KX3 is a pure EV. It is based on the Creta, which I'm not familiar with, C-R-E-T-A, the Creta-based EV, or Creta? Anyway, uh, rumoured to go on sale by the end of this year in China. Uh, the KX3 from Kia is an all-electric car uh, with a 109 brake horsepower electric motor and a top speed of 150 k's. In design, by the way, that kind of uh, small crossover SUV style looks very much like the Kia Nero, in, for instance, by the way. It's sort of a smaller version of the Kia Nero. Um, it's got a 45.2 kilowatt hour battery. Maximum range not yet known. And finally, MIT have published a really useful tool for comparing life cycle emissions, so grams of CO2 per mile, and total cost of ownership of lots of different vehicle types. So you have probably had a conversation with friends in the pub or in a cafe or with your friend or with your mates, and they're talking about how EVs, some of these mainstream press articles say, oh, EVs are even worse than normal cars because of all the, the way that they're made. That's, you know, for instance, and they're not taking into account all of the carbon footprint of producing 
diesel and petrol. Uh, well, this is a really interesting new tool. Uh, it, it's a plot, so okay, it's, you know, x-axis, y-axis, and it's got 100 different cars, popular new car models, plotted on this graph, kind of an interactive graph. You can roll over it with your mouse and it'll pop up all the details. If you move over each of those data points to get more information, uh, and if you're on a, like a touch device, by the way, and you want to try that in a moment, uh, I'll give you the website now. It's called carboncounter.com. That is carboncounter.com. If you're on a touch device, just tap each data point. The x axis. Uh, now that shows the lifetime cost of each vehicle per mile driven. And the y axis shows the greenhouse gas emissions for each vehicle per mile driven. And they've included emissions from producing the different fuels and vehicles. So this is accurate from MIT. Uh, the results show you don't have to pay more for a low carbon vehicle. While the average greenhouse gas emissions of all cars uh, are more than 50% higher, than the 2030 target. Most hybrid and pure EVs right now are meeting that target already 12 years ahead of schedule, with today's electricity mix factored in already. So this MIT website, uh, the greenhouse gas emissions from electricity production, for instance, in California, a half of the US average, and it really shows emissions from EVs drop even below the 2040 climate targets if you charge your EV on Californian electricity. Well, using a combination of low electricity emissions, high fuel prices, and a high share of city driving, MIT have constructed a best-case scenario for EVs. EVs are cheaper than comparable combustion engines already. If you do the opposite, they say, and you choose conditions that favour combustion cars, even so, EVs emit less than the comparable combustion engine vehicles today, disabling the federal tax refunds and the low fuel prices make EVs a little more pricey to buy compared to gas cars, though, uh, but still very competitive. Have a look at this website. It'll, when you look at it, you, everything I've just said will make sense. It's carboncounter.com. It's carboncounter.com. You can tweet about it. You can um, share it with your friends. And it is a way of looking at the total cost of ownership of all the different cars, different drivetrains, including EVs. And it's really obvious how those EVs are all clustered at the bottom left-hand corner of the graph because they're not expensive on total cost of ownership. They're cheaper than gas cars. And, of course, they're not polluting uh, on according to how electricity is produced in many places. And in some markets... Uh, you know, four or five countries around the world, almost all renewables are a part of the electricity mix in terms of all of their electricity is coming from renewables now in a handful of countries. And that's just going to happen more and more around the world. So I thought I'd leave you with that. If you want to have a little play with it, let me know your feedback, by the way. Uh, talking of feedback, um, I don't know if I, I should even mention this, but I have received an email from one of the podcast listeners. And thank you so much. He's a regular listener. And a regu we, we chat over email and on DM sometimes as well. Uh, so thank you very much. I won't say who he is or what car he <laughs> just shouldn't even mention it really or what car he has pre-ordered but some very exciting news because he has pre-ordered uh, a forthcoming ev from his local dealer and he's got some more information but said just don't don't share it just yet not just not just yet uh, so thank you very much uh when we're ready to share that information it, it, it will help you inform your buying decisions by the way and he's happy for me to share it hi to mark as well and mark says I, I love listening to the podcast it's nice to have fresh info every day there's one thing you might want to consider for most native german speakers uh, out of curiosity i ask some others as well it's painful to hear porsche said porsche sorry if i have done that um it's porsche not Porsche. So if I've ever said Porsche, very sorry. Yes, Porsche. And uh, he says it'll be nicer to our ears in the future. I did also, if we're talking German, by the way, I did also uh, tap him up for uh, Mark's opinion on Daimler Daimler. And he says, you know, if I'm asking his opinion, it would be Daimler. OK, thank you very much. Maybe I'll go with that from now on. Uh, if you want to, by the way, listen to every previous podcast. Uh, some of them are new. Some of them are interviews uh, with people in the know. Done a few interviews now that have gone down really well. We've got two more. This coming Saturday is one and a week on Saturday is another one. And both of them I think you're going to be super interested in. Uh, both being published on Saturdays, by the way. 190 previous shows are all on iTunes and Google Play. Uh, tune in, Spotify, YouTube, Stitcher and the blog. 
blog, which is evnewsdaily.com. If you subscribe, well, you get them first and free and automatically. And if you want to come and hang out on the socials, just search EV News Daily. Do have a wonderful day, and I'll catch you tomorrow.